Welcome to the Free Library. My name is Molly Crane, and I'm an attorney at Blank Rome, as well as the co-chair of the Raven Society, the Young Friends Group for the Free Library. From its award-winning author event series to its extensive collections of downloadable and streaming eBooks, audiobooks, music, and more, the Free Library is dedicated to advancing literacy, guiding learning, and inspiring curiosity through thought-provoking programs and life-changing resources. Many of the library's most beloved programs and services are made possible only with the help of private support. Please consider making a gift to the Free Library to help transform lives. You can do so online at freelibrary.org support. And if you are in your 20s or 30s and love the Free Library as much as I do, I would encourage you to join the Raven Society by making a gift of $75 or more. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce to you the very, very funny B.J. Novak. A screenwriter, stand-up comedian, author and director, B.J. is well known for his role as condescending, temp-turned sleazebag Ryan from The Office. He has appeared in several films, including *Inglorious Bastards and Saving Mr. Banks. His writing and performing have received several honors, including Emmy nominations and Screen Actor Guild and Writer Guild Awards. In a glowing review of his new short story collection titled One More Thing, the Washington Post calls BJ a gifted observer of the human condition and a very funny writer capable of winning that rare thing, unselfconscious, insuppressible laughter. And a New York Times review similarly praises, he's a funny writer with a great ear, but also a genuine storyteller with an observant eye and a finely tuned emotional radar. It's wonderful to have him here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming B.J. Novak to the Free Library. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you so much for supporting the Philadelphia Free Library. And thank you even more for supporting me. Uh, I already got a great Philadelphia welcome on the train in when um, I was getting off the train and a man said to me, hey buddy, uh, Scranton's the other way. So, <laughs> kind of said it all. So I wrote this book, uh, One More Thing, Stories and Other Stories, and it just came out in paperback, so that brings me here on a little a book tour of it. So I have about an hour on the stage. I think for the first uh, 20 to 30 minutes, I'll read you a few stories, and then I'll answer any questions about them, and then I'll be signing the book, and I think also for sale is copies of my children's book, The Book with No Pictures, um, as well. So I, there's 64 stories in this book. They're different um, lengths and topics and themes uh, that really vary from two lines to 20 pages. And I figured because we're in the shadow of Valentine's Day, I would focus the stories I read tonight on the theme of love. So there are some adult language. If anyone's not an adult here, um, you can read the book with no pictures outside. Um, but I'm going to read a few short ones that, that touch on different uh, approaches to to love and relationships. This first one um, was on American, um, was on This American Life with great actors doing all the different voices, but I prefer to read them all myself. Uh, this is called Julie and the Warlord. <laughs> okay, she laughed after three complicated cocktails. Now you, sir, yes? <laughs> now, you, sir, now I am okay. I feel like we've only talked about me, but I don't know anything about you other than that you're um, very charming and um, very cute, of course. Ha, don't let that go to your head. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Thank you. But I feel, okay, if this is my, well, okay. What is your job? <laughs> what do I do? You mean... What do I do as a profession? <laughs> Sorry, I hate that question too. It's like, is this a date or an interview, right? He finished his bite of sauce-soaked broccolini and answered, but she didn't hear him clearly. Hmm, all I heard was Lord. Yes. Ooh, okay, this is fun. Are you a landlord? Because I do not have the best history getting along with landlords. My first apartment, I'm not a landlord. 
Are you a drug lord? Julie said, stroke poking the side of his face with her finger, because that could be a problem. No. You're not the Lord, are you? <laughs> because I haven't gone to temple since my bat mitzvah. Ha, <laughs> don't tell my grandma. <laughs> he laughed politely. She could tell he was laughing just to be nice, and she liked that more than if he had laughed from finding her funny. A nice guy. Now that would be a real change of pace for her. Then what kind of Lord are you anyways, eh? She asked with an old-timey, what's the big idea accent. God, she was a bit tipsy, wasn't she? I'm a warlord. Interesting. <laughs> now, I don't know exactly what this is, but I want to learn. So, what exactly is a warlord? Julie asked, her chin now resting playfully on a V of two upturned palms. Educate me. Okay. Can you picture where the Congo is on a map? Kinda, she exaggerated. <laughs> this is Africa, he said, pointing to an imaginary map in the air between them. This is the Indian Ocean. This is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is just regular Congo. What? Hold up. <laughs> I know, that's just how it is. I didn't name them, the warlord laughed. Anyway, this, all this here, this is what I control. So you're like the governor of it? <laughs> no. There are certain areas of the world where it will show up on your map as a certain country, but in reality, no government is in control of that region in any real way. They cannot collect taxes. They cannot enforce laws. Do you follow? Yes, nodded Julie. The people that are in charge are the warlords. They, we, bribe, kidnap, indoctrinate, torture, and... What am I forgetting? What's the fifth one? Oh, kill. Ha. That's weird that I forgot that one. The population of any region that falls above a certain threshold of natural resources, but below a certain threshold of government protection. It's not exactly that simple, Julie, but basically that determines where I'm based. Once those conditions reach that level, me and my team, we show up and terrorize that area until the entire population is either dead, subdued, or ideally, one of our soldiers. Ideally, ideally, dream scenario, a child soldier. <laughs> that does not sound legal, <laughs> said Julie, trying to stall for time so that she could object properly and intelligently, which was going to take a second because she had had a couple of drinks already and had not anticipated having to debate a hot button topic like this at the top of her intelligence, especially not with someone who did it for a living. <laughs> no, it isn't legal at all. Have you been listening? Julie blushed and rotated her fork on her napkin in a four-point turn so that she would have something to focus on besides her embarrassment. This is a show outside the ability of any government to enforce its laws. He went on and on. The words rape and limbs came up more than on any other date she could remember. <laughs> what about, like, the international community? Asked Julie, hoping this was a smart question. Usually this was something she was good at on dates, but tonight she was having more trouble. Don't they ever pressure you to stop? Or, she added, thinking there might be something else there, or something? Yes, said the warlord. Sure. For example, there was this thing about me on Twitter a while ago. Are you on Twitter? She said she was, but didn't check it often. Same here, he laughed. I have an account, but I can never figure out if it's a thing I'm doing or not. Anyway. I was trending. You know what that is? She did. I'll be honest, it weirded me out. I got into this pattern where I was checking my name every two seconds and there were like 45 new mentions of me, all negative. You can't let yourself fall into that, said Julie. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, it passed, said the warlord. You know Twitter. Before long, everyone's on to the next shit. What about, asked Julie, downing the last sip of her cocktail as she felt a premature ripple of seriousness returning. The ethics of it. How do you feel about that? Does that trouble you? The warlord gestured to Julie with his fork. That top you're wearing, anthropology? H&M, said Julie, but thank you. 
<laughs> Even better, said the warlord. Do you know the conditions in the factories that made that top that you're wearing? Do you ever think about that? Yeah, okay, no. <laughs> That's not nice try. Just because, no, and yes, I know this phone right here that I use every day, but no, no, you can't. It doesn't help to equate look, said Julie. <laughs> There's no excuse. But that also does not mean just in case you're thinking about dessert, whispered the waitress, dropping off two stiff sheets of artisan paper in front of Julie and the warlord. Remember when they used to ask first if you wanted to see a dessert menu? Asked the warlord. Now everyone just ambushes you with a dessert menu without asking, when did that start? I know, said Julie. Everyone started doing that at the same time too. How does stuff like that happen? Everywhere just, she snapped, changing their policy at the exact same time. Get Malcolm Gladwell on that, said the warlord. <laughs> I know, right? They both scanned the menus, each pair of eyes starting in the unhelpful middle of the dessert menu for some no reason, then tipsily circling around and around until most of the important words had been absorbed. I have never understood flourless chocolate cake, stated the warlord finally. Is flour such a bad thing? I mean compared to the other things in chocolate cake. You wanna split that, said Julie. <laughs> Flour is probably the least unhealthy thing I can think of in chocolate cake, the warlord continued. Is that supposed to be the point? That the whole cake is just eggs and sugar and butter? And anyway, who cares? It's chocolate cake. We know it's not a health food. Use whatever ingredients you want. All it has to do is taste good. We don't need to know how you did it, just make it. You want to maybe split that? Asked Julie again. <laughs> we will split the flourless chocolate cake, declared the warlord. Great, said the waitress, disappearing again. So do you get to travel a lot? Asked Julie. Not as much as I'd like. Now and then we'll reach some ceasefire after some especially big massacre and things get quiet for a bit. That's what allowed me to take some time off, travel, meet you, stuff like that. Oh, I meant to say, you look even better in person than in your profile picture. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've been meaning to tell you that. Nice surprise. Rare it goes in that direction. Ha, huh. well, thanks. Um, same, don't let that go to your head. <laughs> thanks. So, hmm, lost my train of thought. Ceasefires? Right, so, you know ceasefires, they never stick. <laughs> yes, I think I saw something about that on Jon Stewart. That must be frustrating. It is. Thank you, Julie. That's exactly the right word. It is very frustrating. Flourless chocolate cake, said the waitress. Thank you, said Julie and the warlord at the same time. Can I get you anything else? Another drink? I really shouldn't, said Julie. Are you okay to drive, by the way? I have a driver, said the warlord. Julie ordered a fourth and final cocktail. <laughs> Discussion question. Do you think Julie should fuck the warlord? <laughs> why or why not? Thank you very much. That was Julie and the warlord. <laughs> this American Life aired it without the discussion question, otherwise same story. I think I'll read one more that's slightly longer and then take questions. Uh, this is one of my favorites from early in the book. Uh, this is called No One Goes to Heaven to See Dan Fogelberg. <laughs> Tim, nine years old, leaned next to his grandmother as she lay in her hospital bed. He gently kissed her tubes. I'm sorry. Tim, <laughs> nine years old, leaned next to his grandmother as she lay in her hospital bed. He gently kissed her face around the tubes in her nose. I love you, Nana, said Tim. I promise I'll visit you in heaven. The next day, Tim's grandmother died. 66 years after that, Tim died. The first thing Tim did when he got to heaven was look for his wife. He was so anxious and excited to find her that he couldn't focus on anything else not the fact that he had died, not the fact that he was in heaven, and certainly not his grandmother. 
Is Lin here? He asked everyone he met. Yes, they said. But he kept asking, Is Lin here? Yes, they laughed. You'll see her in like two seconds. And there she was, standing beside a park bench in a spring dress, looking at the same time the way she looked when he had known her last, at the hour of her death just under a year ago, and the way she looked at her very most beautiful, the day he married her, when she was 22 and he was 25. It was a far deeper and sharper moment of first love than the first first moment of first love, because now not only was he falling in love, but he was falling in love with someone he loved. And while the first time he also believed he'd be with her forever, he was too young to consider what forever meant. Now here he was truly on the first day of forever. He kissed her for an eternity, which was fine because heaven had eternities to burn. Then he kissed her for another. It wouldn't have been heaven without you. He took her hand in his and they strolled out of the park together. Oh, and you gotta remind me, said Tim as they walked, one of these days I have to visit my grandma. Remind me, okay? Of course, said Lynn, I would love to meet her. But first, they looked up their friends, the ones they had shared the main length of their life together. They brought to each house a bottle of wine that never emptied, and they visited everyone for hours, laughing late into the night, reminiscing and gossiping about who had died and who hadn't. Then they'd wake up early the next morning, make coffee and French toast, and talk about the friends they had visited and whether or not heaven had changed them. <laughs> next, they went to see Tim's parents, who were doing very well, and were very happy to see both of them. Have you visited Nana yet? Asked his parents. Not yet, said Tim, but soon. Next, they visited Lynn's mother. You know your father's here, Lynn's mother told Lynn. Lynn was surprised to hear this. <laughs> it would be the right thing to visit him. Tim had never met Lynn's father, but he had heard all about their relationship. Her father abandoned her family when she was 13 and only saw her once more when he showed up unannounced at her high school graduation and tried to reconcile, ruining the day for her. She had retaliated by rebuffing him publicly and rudely. She did not want to see him at all, but she could tell it was the right thing to do, and heaven was the kind of place that made you want to do the right thing. We'll go together, said Tim. It'll be fine. Lynn's father opened the door to his oversized condominium with a huge grin. Of course, he would have a condominium in heaven. <laughs> Remember at your high school graduation, he said, when you told me to go to hell? <laughs> he smiled like he had been looking forward to saying that line for a long time. <laughs> what a jerk, she said after they left. Why did they let him in? He must have changed, said Tim and then changed back? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> said Tim, who knows how things work here? Well, maybe this is better because I got to feel mercy or something, or close that chapter or whatever, I did it, you know? That's a good attitude, said Tim, and it was the right thing to do. Now you can enjoy heaven with a clear conscience. The next day, Tim called Nana. Hello? Nana? Who's this? Nana, it's Tim. Tim who? Tim Donahue. Eliza's husband? Oh, she sounded unhappy. Hi. No, <laughs> Tim Jr., Eliza's son. Timmy, your grandson. Timmy. Oh, goodness, Timmy, you died? You're just a little boy. No, Nan, I'm all grown up now. I'm in my 70s. It was. Oh, thank goodness. I still pictured you as a little boy. How did everything wind up? Well, there's a lot to cover, Nana. We want to come visit you. I have a wife now. I want you to meet her. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. It will be so wonderful to see you both. When's good? Said Tim. When? Oh, hmm. Nana paused. I have a bunch of stuff next week. I'm seeing some friends and there's a couple concerts I want to see. How about next weekend? The, the weekend after this coming weekend, I mean. We, we would love that. How about Sunday for dinner? like old times, huh? Like the Sunday dinners you used to make us when we were kids? Oh, sure, we could do that or we could order in, lot of options here. <laughs> Let's decide closer to then, okay? Okay, Nana, I love you. I'm so happy I'm gonna get to see you. Me too, I love you too. See you next Sunday, but not this one, the next one, bye now. <laughs> Nana sounded odd, Tim said after he hung up or, or something. 
Maybe she's upset that you didn't get in touch with her before. I, I don't know, said Tim. It, it's hard to tell that stuff over the phone. And also, there's a lot to do here. You know, I hadn't seen you. I hadn't explored heaven. It's not like anyone's going anywhere. It'll be better on Sunday, said Lynn, when we see her. You're right, Tim agreed. On Sunday, Tim called to confirm. Nana, it's Tim. Just confirming we'll see you tonight. I'm bringing my wife, Lynn. Who? Lynn, my wife. You're, you're going to love her. Who's this? Tim, your grand, Timmy. Timmy! Oh, Tim, oh gosh, tonight, I'm so sorry. Tonight won't work. Can we do next weekend? Sure, said Tim. Yeah, sure. Let me look here. Oh, there's something I have to be at on Saturday, and I'm actually checking out some shows next week. Actually, is two weeks okay? A week from Friday? Can you pencil that in? Sure, said Tim. Perfect. I'll see you next Friday. A week from, I mean. Okay, Nana, I, I love you. Love you too. A week from Friday, Tim and Lynn showed up at the door of Nana's house. On the door was a note. Tim, tried to call you last minute, but no one picked up. So sorry, but there's a concert I just had to see with friends. Won't be back till very late. So sorry, must reschedule. Talk soon. I love you, Nana. Tim turned to Lynn. Am I crazy to take this a little personally at this point? This is weird, Lynn agreed. A concert? Again? Weren't you too close? I, I thought so. Maybe you're right. Maybe she's mad I didn't contact her before. But then why wouldn't she just say it? I don't know. I guess she would have. Well, what should we do tonight? Asked Lynn, trying on a smile and finding it fit perfectly. We're all dressed up. It's a Friday night in heaven. Yeah, <laughs> we can go out ourselves, can't we? Want to check out one of those concerts? Sure, said Tim. Why should Nana have all the fun? Tim and Lynn walked through the streets of heaven at sunset. A breeze blew through the pink and purple air. Dogs barked, birds sang. Children with old souls finally laughed lightly. Horses, bicycles, and vintage convertibles shared the wide streets. As Tim and Lynn got closer to the center of town, they started walking past posters. Tonight, Bo Diddley, free. Tonight, Bing Crosby, free. Tonight, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, live, free. Look at this, said Lynn. No wonder your Nana's out at concerts every night. Richie Valens, the big bopper. Curtis Mayfield, Sid Vicious is here? Debussy, is this all really free? Asked Lynn. Roy Orbison, Tim pointed to a sign. Want to check this out? It was transcendent a private concert and an arena show at the same time. None of the things that had kept them away from live music events before had made their way to heaven. No sweat or aggression in their row. No songs from the new album that the musician was overly sincere about now, but would be embarrassed by in a few years. No confusion or pressure as to whether they should sit or stand or dance or put their hands in the air. The sound was impeccable. So was the stage design. They could eat, drink, smoke, make out. They had front row seats. There were no crowds. They were literally the only people there. After a few hits, but still at the height of the show, Tim turned to Lynn with an indulgent idea. Want to just check out the next one? <laughs> Why not, said Lynn. They went to the stadium next door. It was also a private concert in a giant arena. Just as they walked in, John Denver launched into a blasting rendition of Take Me Home, Country Roads. When he finished, Tim and Lynn gave a standing ovation. Hello, heaven! This is amazing, remarked Tim. I know. It's almost even too perfect, said Lynn. Like, in a way, I would like it if there were a few people here, a little energy, you know? That could be the motto for heaven, said Tim. Almost too perfect. They snuck out to see the next show. As they kept walking toward the center of the music and arts district, the streets became more and more crowded. Tim and Lynn started seeing more of all types of people, occasionally even celebrities. For example, Ricardo Montalban. <laughs> he was an actor they both recognized from the television show Fantasy Island, but he wasn't being mobbed at all. He almost looked like he wished he would be, or that at least someone would approach him to ask a question or pose for a picture. Tim wondered why no one was going up to talk to him and then to try to figure it out, asked himself the same question. Why wasn't he approaching Ricardo Montalban? 
probably because there were more interesting things in heaven than Ricardo Montalban. It must be hard being Ricardo Montalban in heaven, <laughs> thought Tim. As they got within a half mile of the center of the district, Tim and Lynn finally realized why the concerts had been so empty before. Look, whispered Lynn, look. Elvis Presley, live, free. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, <laughs> live, free. L. V. Beethoven, live, free. Tim and Lynn stared in awe as people poured by the millions into stadiums bigger than they could have imagined to see the greatest artists not only of their generation, but of their entire generation's consciousness. Hundreds of thousands of people lined up to see Miles Davis, millions to see Tupac Shakur, <laughs> billions to see Michael Jackson. We can see anyone, remarked Tim to Lynn. We can see anyone of all time. It was almost too much to comprehend. It was a good thing they were already used to love or they might have fainted from the size of the feeling. They decided on Frank Sinatra, a favorite of both of theirs, and headed in to his concert. It couldn't have been any more of a thrill. Sinatra was at the top of his game. He opened with the best is yet to come and a crowd of 700 million chanted along. Then a song they had never heard before, a new one, Sinatra warned, making everyone nervous. But it was as good as one of the classics, and they had heard it first. Then my way, then fly me to the moon, then New York, New York, then one for my baby. Now here are a few songs whose artists haven't made their way to heaven yet, intoned Sinatra in the same soothing, ever-knowing voice he'd had in life, made even more poignant here as he stroked the quaintly unnecessary chord of his microphone. I hope they won't mind me giving you a little preview, keeping the songs warm for them. And then Tim and Lynn took in the soul-expanding sight of Frank Sinatra covering the hits of Bruce Springsteen, Radiohead, Coldplay, and Beyonce. Heaven cared not for the limits of era. After five hours and 19 encores full of more of his own hits, the concert finally drew to a close. Tim kissed Lynn and she kissed him back. They felt like they were in heaven. They were, of course, but they felt like it too. <laughs> Still, even after all that, they didn't want the show to end. And when they looked down, they realized what was hanging around their necks. Backstage passes, all access, VIP. <laughs> of course, said Lynn, of course we have these. They went backstage. They showed the badges tentatively to the first person they saw in a uniform who nodded respectfully and walked them to a wide, clean corridor under the stadium. It was a billion seat stadium, so the hallway was long. But along the way, not a single person second guessed their right to be there. Tim and Lynn were escorted along the hallway until they were finally left by themselves outside a single unmarked door. Tim and Lynn looked at each other. Could it be this easy? Asked Lynn. It's heaven, said Tim. No need to guard the door. Tim knocked, but heard nothing. He knocked again harder and heard nothing. He tried the knob of the door and found it was unlocked, of course, and swung open easily. And there, leaning casually against a closet door with his eyes half closed, was Frank Sinatra. And there, on the floor, on her knees, was Nana <laughs> blowing Frank Sinatra. You gotta understand something, Timmy, <laughs> said Nana, glowing and gorgeous and angry and mysterious as she closed her robe with one hand and the door to Sinatra's dressing room behind her with the other. And it's lovely to meet you, Lynn. Lynn, Tim, Lynn, I'm so happy for you both and I love you, Timmy, so much. But you have to understand, when I met you, everybody was dead, my husband, Two of my kids, my parents, of course, my sister, all of my friends, not everybody, but yeah, kind of everybody, you know? And I was part dead from it. I didn't know I was at the time. And believe me, I was so happy and grateful for the love I did have in my life in the form of you and your little sister whose name escapes me at the moment. <laughs> Danielle, that was her name, wasn't it? 
My, what a beauty. Nana smiled at the memory. She was my... I loved you all equally, all so much. <laughs> that love was real, and it still is. And Lynn, welcome to the family. She hugged Tim again and kissed Lynn on the cheek. Oh, isn't it exciting? Everybody's here. There's so much going on. Nana took a drag from the live half of a cigarette, which she had neatly hidden between her fingers by the doorknob. It's funny, isn't it? said Nana. You have infinite time here, and there are infinite things to do, but you still don't end up doing much of it. You do what you love most over and over. She took another breath of smoke, which couldn't kill her now. There's something I think about sometimes when I'm walking through the town looking at the different concerts. So many of them were so big in their time, and people loved them. But maybe it's just because it was all they had, you know? There's this guy, Dan Fogelberg. I, I recognize the name. I, I think your mom liked him. He did this song and that song. I'm not saying he wasn't great or a big deal or worth seeing. I'm sure he was great. But no one goes to heaven to see Dan Fogelberg. You know what I mean? Yes, said Tim. Yes, said Lynn. I love you, Timmy. It, it's just... I only knew you for nine years, and I'm young here, you know? I, I have other things to do besides dinner at Grandma's. He got it, and he got her, too, more than ever, and maybe for the first time. I love you, Nana, said Tim. I love you, too, said Nana. Gotta go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. So um, those are two of the stories in the book. Um, the first one's kind of an average length. The second one is one of the four or five long stories in the book. And then many others are a couple lines, uh, a couple pages. Really, anything that I thought was complete, I just called it, called it complete. Um, and I would love to answer. Thank you again for, for indulging me to read for such a long time. And any questions that you guys have, uh, I'll do my best. Thanks, BJ. Folks, the way this works, you raise your hand, wait for the mic, and we'll run one to you. Who'd like to start us off? Does your grandmother know you wrote that story? My grandmother's in heaven, reading it, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what she's up to? First reader, right here in the second row. Hi. Actually, I don't want you to stop reading. Would you tell us the two-line one, at least? Sure. I can give you a two-line story. We have time for Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the one I was thinking of doing about love, there's a couple about love, but I'll read you the only poem in the book that calls itself such. This is called The Literalist's Love Poem. Roses are rose. Violets are violet. I love you. Happy Valentine's Day. And on the audio book, Emma Thompson reads that. And she puts more into that than most people can do in a whole novel. Could you describe your thought process or creative process or your imagination, whatever it was, that led you to write the Fogelberg, Fogelberg story that you just told? Um, I will take that as a compliment, but it sounds so much like an accusation. <laughs> I, I thought it'd be funny. Uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to, actually. Uh, um, the story, the, the core of that story, it's funny. I would often write story. I wrote every story that I had a funny idea for, and, um, and most of them didn't make the book. I really wrote on quite a terror um, in about a year period. But the ones that did make the book, I realized later what all of them were really about. They all had some personal um, part of me that had transmuted into into this form. So that story for me is uh, where that comes from. The first throb of it was the thought of Ricardo Montalban in heaven um, <laughs> and what it would be like. And I sort of, and I realized maybe after there's a Tupac song called Thug Mansion, I think, where he talks about all the artists in heaven. And that might have been in my head. I heard it years ago. I didn't realize that until a couple months ago. But the real, the core of the story, uh, the emotional core of the story that made me finish it and, and put myself in it inadvertently was I am a, a performer and I do stand-up a lot 
And I would perform stand-up often to an audience, let's say I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, and a thousand college kids came to a gym to hear me. And they love what I'm doing, you know, and I'm the biggest thing in the world in my mind. But a part of me at some point thought, well, yes, but if Steve Carell were in the auditorium next door, that would be tonight's show, let alone if Mark Twain was here or Charlie Chaplin or Chris Rock or anyone, if you could take anyone f from all time, I would not have a thousand people. I'd, I'd have no one and that would be fair. Uh, I'm, <laughs> all of us on different levels are stars of circumstance. And I thought of that idea in terms of uh, Montalban and, and really myself, I think I didn't, um, uh, Dan Fogelberg was just kind of a, a good stand in for it, but I thought of myself as Dan Fogelberg. I thought, yeah, I'm pretty good, but I, all this that I'm getting in this lifetime, all of you here, if, if William Shakespeare were next door, <laughs> I wouldn't blame you all for being over there. Uh, so we're stars of circumstance in our life, and then I, I framed it in terms of someone who was a star in his family, because that was all his grandmother had. All, all she had was, everyone was dead. She had a nine-year-old boy, and she put everything into that. But even in our own families and, and lives, we can, our stardom is, is partly on circumstance. And so a lot of the stories in the book are about what we consider important and should consider important and how it stacks up against the infinite. That I think, looking back on the book, those were the, the ones that grabbed me enough to complete them. So thank you for the very great question that I, the student in me took defensively, like, oh no, <laughs> what did I do wrong? Got a lady in blue in the front row, and then there's one in back about three quarters of the way. Thank you. What makes you giddy at this point? Um, what makes me giddy? Uh, something unexpected, I guess. Sure. Um, well, you never know as soon as you expect it. It's over. But, um, you know, I just did... A, a, another book tour this year for the book with no pictures, my book for children, and I would uh, <laughs> I would let the kids come up to the microphone and ask questions, and most of them either never knew what a question was or <laughs> forgot on the journey to the microphone, and they would make declarations um, about their interests uh, once they got there. And that never ceased to, to make me giddy. My favorite one being, I had a dream about you and my mom. <laughs> this is in a city I had never visited before, I swear. So. <laughs> There's one toward the back there. Hi, I'm wondering what your inspiration was for your cereal sweepstakes. Oh, the cereal uh, contest. Um, I, so there's a, Maybe the longest story in the book um, is called Kellogg's, and it's about a boy who wins a uh, sweepstakes prize in a Kellogg's cornflakes box of $100,000 and learns through his complicated journey to claim the prize uh, that his father is not his real father. And, and it's because of that fame. I loved, I always thought I was going to win these contests as a kid. And this story, too, a, a great deal of my childhood went into this story, although to the point where a younger cousin of mine, 11 years old, asked me if the story was true. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you'd know. Like, this describes a completely different family in Michigan with real paternity uh, question. And, um, but it felt very real to her, and I think it's because sort of the emotional details and, and some of the minutia were very much my actual childhood. Um, I love those contests. I always uh, thought I was going to win. I did lose a contest, as it describes in the book. And my father did pull a dictionary down from the wall and say, if you can guess the word on this page, I'll give you $100,000. And I guessed wrong. And I, I didn't really know what it was. And I have a theory now that it's about, you're never going to win this stuff. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't know. And so that's directly in the story, too. Um, but um, I think the, the emotional core of that one to me, this kid pursues this, this uh, Kellogg's prize. It's something even deeper than the money uh, that, that brings him to Kellogg's. It's this name brand 
shine. And I was, I grew up, we couldn't have sugar cereals. We didn't have that many name brand cereals. I know a lot of kids now, my, the children of my hipster urbane friends who never have any name brand stuff in the house. And I was very drawn to that. I loved that. And as, as it says in the story, the kid says, I was a name brand kid and I was supposed to have a name brand life. Um, so that is sort of, for me, uh, whether it's Kellogg's or NBC, you know, the lure since I was a kid of somehow being in that glossy name brand America when you were growing up in, in sort of a more, in my case, uh, literary uh, skeptical niche, that, that was a very, very strong pull. And I wondered about fate, which is discussed a lot in the story. So it, I think the emotional core, the, the minor throb of it was, uh, you know, these contests were interesting. I always wondered what would happen. And I was always fascinated by Kellogg's family members are ineligible for the sweepstakes. I was like, what if you won? It'd be so terrible. <laughs> which is what the whole plot hinges on, that he wins and um, his parents say, you can't claim the prize, but he doesn't know why they won't let him. Um, his father is a, real father is a Kellogg's executive. Um, <laughs> but I think the bigger issue is, you know, I wanted to be a name brand kid. Another question? Yeah, I'm back here. Hi. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> so um, you have some stories that are like two sentences long. And obviously, like, a bound book is the right medium for that, but um, this is what you decided. But uh, lengthwise, it could have easily been a tweet, and you're very, like, active on social media. Not to brag, but my tweet was the last one you favored before you got on stage. Nice. But, um, <laughs> um, so, like, how do you, what do you think of Twitter as a comedic tool? I think Twitter is a great comedic tool. Um, one of the pieces in this book was originally on Twitter. Um, it's called If You Love Something. And the length of it is as thus. If you love something, let it go. If you don't love something, definitely let it go. <laughs> Basically, just drop everything. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> and uh, I, I thought it was appropriate for the book, and I think that it, it had been um, favorited. You know the feeling. Um, <laughs> had given me the confidence to think, oh, this does, re it's not just me with this crazy thought, it does resonate. So I like, I think social media is great. I have a, a sort of uh, contrarian opinion that social media is making people better writers than we've ever had, potentially. Um, of course, the language, I, I don't think language is, written language has ever mutated as fast as it is in this era, when bay can come one month and be gone the next, and uh, commas come and go, and. Uh, all sorts of things. I also maintain the Twitter account of my 16-year-old sister, Keo Novak, and keeping up with her, what her world would be, um, is its own fascinating linguistic challenge. And I think emojis are as, as influential to written language and therefore the communication that we engage in every day. They're as influential as some letters of the alphabet at this point. I, I really, this is fact to me. So. I think social media is fascinating in that people are writing for other people to read more hours of the day than any time in human history. And yes, we can mourn the loss of apostrophes, um, but we could also focus on the fact that we are writing all day for for a readership, um, which, which has never happened before, and I wonder, I, how much that will change the next generation for the better. I hope, I hope it's a great thing. I think it is. A few more questions? Yeah, right here in the middle, and then there's one in front. Could you keep your hand up? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so you favored one of my tweets. Thank you. It was great. <laughs> and my question, I guess, is do you, you and Mindy Kaling enjoy messing with us, like, on... <laughs> the Super Bowl, I really like the tweet, you're not invisible to me, Mindy. Do you guys enjoy the social media, like everyone attacking you guys about your secret relationship, or is it <laughs> super annoying at this point? Are you asking because if I enjoy it, you have something to say publicly? Maybe. Um, I think the honest answer is, um, there, there's two honest answers. One, it's the only way to get Mindy to respond. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think it's, it's the equivalent of uh, if you're, it, it's just you're in front of your friends 
you, you know people, you, there's some things you don't say when people are listening. But yeah, it's kind of fun if you have, if you have like a, a funny diss, it's funnier to say it in front of your friends, you know? And some of the friends, I guess, are strangers. <laughs> in front here, yeah. Okay, sure, why don't you go in the morning? Okay, go it's going to seem like a declaration at first, but I promise there's a question. Um, so you talked about authors and Mark Twain and Shakespeare, um, and I wonder how much you define yourself as a writer and how much you define yourself by other identities, like comedian or things like that. Um, it's a good question. I think uh, I define myself. It's another social media thing, really, because I think people, another good thing about social media is people can define themselves by their Facebook page. And uh, it's, it's not you, but it's a version of you that you have more control over than anything else. I'd compare it to the clothes that you wear or the family last name that you have or your um, skin tone. I mean, people from the beginning of time have been judging us based on the appearance we put forward. At least we can author these appearances more by far than any other time. Um, so I think we're in an age where we're used to defining our identity as just, I'm, I have these 12 interests and these 50, you know, uh, favorite whatevers. So I, I see myself mainly as a writer, primarily as a writer. And uh, I also see myself as a comedian, as I feel like I'm Michael Scott listing my uh, <laughs> friend first, boss second, <laughs> probably an entertainer third. Um, I guess I think of myself as an entertainer uh, more than I do um, any other um, way to parse being a writer because I feel that if I wrote some, for me personally, if I wrote something that no one uh, cared for but that was great on some existential level, it wouldn't matter to me. My goal is to, is to affect people in a good way. So I think that's an entertainer's need more than it is an author's need. Um, although they overlap more than they don't, but I see myself that way. But I, more than I would say a writer, more than an actor or a, a comedian, Every now and then I catch myself doing some like actory thing and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> um, so I, I do have that in me, but um, that's what she said. But um, <laughs> again, the need for laughter, I guess I have some of that. Some of that. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you for that, the lady on our left. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering where your favorite place to write is. It, it's always changing my favorite place to write. Um, it, um, I hope it's not on the wane, but I'm a little scared that it might be. My house has been my favorite place to write. I took a meeting once, and someone I commented on how beautiful the office is, and it was uh, at DreamWorks was the meeting that Steven Spielberg found, and I commented on that. And the woman said, Steven Spielberg's philosophy is make your office the most appealing room of your house so you'll always want to go in there. I thought that was brilliant. So when I got a house, I scoped out what the best area would be so I could put like a long table right there and just sort of have the best seat in the house would be where I write. And it's worked marvelously um, for three years and now I kind of like, I, you, it's like I think when you're training physically, when you're working out, you, got, you can't just only do running or yoga, you, you know, they, then they sort of, you gotta find something new. So I think I'm right now finding something new but it tends to be at home with music playing um, in the best, you know, seat of my house. I like a view. Mm. A few more questions? Yeah, on the aisle here in the middle, and then we'll come to this gentleman here. So my son absolutely loves your children's book, and I was just curious uh, how long it took you to write that, and if you could talk a little bit about that process and how it compares to writing for adults. Uh, sure. Uh, well, The Book With No Pictures is very similar in its spirit of, of being a book that I wrote to read out loud, which I wrote this to read out loud, and, uh, and that I really wanted to entertain more than influence. Um, although there's some influential aspects of it that I hadn't realized that I'm very happy about, um, such as showing kids that words are something that can be uh, mischievous and on their side. Uh, that is, I think, a very exciting message that I hadn't thought of. That was, that was sort of came to me the way one of the shortest stories would come to me 
in the book. Just like I had an idea, I wrote it out, I, and it was more or less done in its recognizable form right then. Then, as with the book, it took actually far longer to follow through than it did to write because then I literally I uh, mocked it up in sort of a book form and I took it to the houses of friends with kids and I'd read it to the kid, I'd watch the parent read it to the kid, I would make edits each time, I'd take pages out, I'd move words around on the page spatially. Um, so, you know, as with, as with this book, as with the shorter stories, it sort of, it came out in one moment and then it was a lot of editing afterwards. I'm really glad uh, your kid likes it. Gentleman right here. How you doing? Hey. Um, I just wanted to say you didn't favor my tweet. What? Just, just kidding. <laughs> did you at me? I did, but I don't know what happened. All right, I'll, t I'll take a look. <laughs> so anyway, um, if you were in heaven, what concert would you go to? Oh. Um, I would see Kurt Cobain. Um, I guess he wouldn't have the rest of Nirvana there, though. Um, <laughs> I'd love to see him solo, though. That's, for me, formative. That was, you know, that was like a big loss as a fan to me. I was exactly that age. I think it's really, for most people, it's whoever you were like the first musician that showed you what adulthood was going to be like for you. You know, it was not cute. And they did something that was not cute, and yet you responded to it. So for me, that was him. What would you see in heaven? Yeah, sure. One last question here, Lady in Black. Four rows back. So let's say you have a young and impressionable niece or nephew. Um, what book would you foist on them, besides your own, um, that contains some formative life lessons? Um, my, I can say some of my favorites that I'd hope would be their favorites, but uh, for me, it was, there's a, a saying, read it whim, read it whim. Some great author said that. And it would be, it's important in my opinion to have a kid feel, like I was saying before, that reading is their form of rebellion, their personal space. And I think what I resisted as a kid was a book about Martin Luther King, a book about recycling, a book about things I knew I was supposed to care about. But I was drawn to books that were, that seemed to me, like Shel Silverstein would be, a name I'd give that seemed to me, or Roald Dahl, would seem to me rambunctious and rebellious. And even Dr. Seuss is this way. As a kid, you feel like Dr. Seuss doesn't give a shit about your parents. <laughs> like, he's just there for you. And I think Roald Dahl is a good example of that. So th those would be my specific uh, personal recommendations. But I think the important thing is whatever, if it's a comic book, whatever a kid grabs that makes them feel that this is part of their independence, is the important thing because I think everyone eventually goes through an adolescent style period where you are rebelling against everything. And I was very lucky in that when my rebellion came, I turned to books and I would read, you know, Kerouac and Bukowski and um, Sartre, not understand it, but like I wanted to read angry, rebellious people who had died young. And um, I, that to me was super cool. And I realized looking back, it's great that I turned two books when I was feeling that way. And so I think the earlier that a kid thinks of a book as their ally and not their teacher, uh, that's the important thing. So, but my specifics for me anyway were, were Shel Silverstein, Roald Dahl. Um, um, but yeah, it could be Twilight. I mean, it really, it's about how much the kid feels that that's, that's their independent place to be. Didn't opinion. think we'd leave it at twilight. Please join me in thanking <laughs> Thank BJ Novak. Thank you very much. Walk out that way. What's that? We'll walk out this way and then.